I'm Gene Coletta, editor of the Latin America Advisor at the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington. Socialist Pedro Castillo is clinging to a razor thin lead ahead of his rival, conservative Keiko Fujimori, after Sunday's presidential election runoff in Peru. More than 99% of the ballots have been counted and the vote is split almost exactly down the middle. Castillo leads by less than half of one percentage point and Fujimori is already claiming fraud. To examine this close election and its impact, we're joined by Cynthia McClintock. She's professor of political science and international affairs at the George Washington University, and she joins us from here in Washington. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today, Cynthia. Well, thank you so much, Gene, for the invitation. It's great to be here. Wonderful. Now, uh, Cynthia, this election is so close, with Castile having a slim lead, Fujimori raising unsubstantiated allegations of fraud. Now, how do you see this situation playing out over the next several days? And when do you think we could finally know when the winner, who the winner is? I wish I could be optimistic, Jean, but, but I can't. No, um, Keiko Fujimori ha has a history in the 2016 election when she also lost very, very narrowly but to someone in that case who was much closer to her ideologically. And in that case, she waited quite a while uh, to concede. And then for the next you know, five years, virtually you know, obstructed the, the president and uh, his successor. So she has a history of um, not accepting results that go against her, unfortunately. Uh, now in Peru, there are you know, there are rights to impugn ballots. There will be ballots that will be contested. My guess is that Peru's Electoral Commission will be very careful. No, they're very aware there was already clashes on the streets on Sunday night. No, it's a very, very precarious situation with a great deal of risk of violence. Presumably that will settle down. Uh, we have quite a while until the inauguration on July 28th. Um, but once, uh, presumably Castillo is inaugurated, I mean, the road ahead for him is going to be very, very rough. Right now, when there ultimately is a winner and the winner is finally sworn in, in July, um, after we've had such a close vote, what's the risk of half of the country just simply refusing to accept that the next president was indeed elected legitimately. And what will that mean for the next president's ability to even govern? Exactly. No, the risk was very high uh, even before the first round because things were looking quite grim. And then with the results of the first round, you know, it became, uh, the prospects became darker. Uh, I think with the campaign, it was very, very, um, polarized, very confrontational outlook, even bleaker. And then with the results so razor thin, you know, it, almost inevitable that, that the loser is going to have trouble accepting the results. And as you said, in this case, you know, in contrast to the first round, it really is sort of half the country has decided that uh, Fujimori uh, is corrupt, that she would be authoritarian. Uh, and this, of course, is, you know, these are not mild criticisms, these are very severe criticisms. And on the other hand, uh, the supporters of Fujimori believe that, you no, know, as you said, that uh, Castillo is a far left radical socialist who would lead Peru to being Maduro, Venezuela. So you now both sides are terrified. You no, know, both sides have grounds for fears. Uh, no, it's a very, very worrisome situation. What will it look like with regard to the next president's um, dynamics with Congress, you know, whether it's Castillo or Fujimori, um, how able will the next president be able to get legislation passed, given, you know, the party's control of, of Congress and the dynamics that work there? If uh, Fujimori were to somehow you know, reverse the, the current trends, she would have a better chance of building a majority. She currently has 45% uh, of the seats, if you include uh, the parties that strongly supported her for the runoff, uh, you know, from the first round to the runoff. Uh, and she has a capacity to co-opt and to intimidate. So we've seen that before. So she would probably, 
uh, be able to build something of a, of a coalition. Now, her promises, however, were also very extravagant. Both candidates fell into a populist mode of you know, promising the moon, the moon and, um, and again, people, the reason that the right uh, in Peru splintered was because you know, a lot of the other candidates also fear the, you know, they don't fear her and don't like her and worry about her. So, you know, it would still be very, very tough. There could be additional, even though she will try to uh, prevent a judicial ruling against her that, you know, could happen in certain ways. It'll be, I mean, if she has president, if she's president, she'll have immunity, but it would still be, you could imagine things coming out the way they have <laughs> and through it and uh, could be really rough. Castillo, I cannot envision a way forward where he could have anything near a majority in the legislature. The impeachment is very easy in Peru. It's been done twice before in the last uh, you know, 21 years. So, and almost done a couple more times. Uh, and especially given this desire of everyone to do this whole election over, uh, it's very hard really to see him hanging on. Uh, he only has approximately one third you know, of the legislative seats if you include the center left party that allied with him uh, for, for the runoff. Um, his only chance as I see it to survive would be to moderate quite dramatically, but in that case, he could well split his party Puro Libre, which is the party with a plurality in the legislature at the moment. So he's really between a rock and a hard place. And he's also promised, for example, a, not only major, major uh, social and economic changes, but he's promised a constituent assembly very loudly. And I don't think his backers want to fall back on that, but that could create all kinds of conflicts and delays and problems and fears of investors. So he's got a really, really rough road out there just to survive. Right now, and I want to ask you a little bit more about that too. Um, you mentioned the the impeachments of uh, former presidents. As you know, uh, in a little over three years, Peru has had four presidents. One was impeached, another resigned under threat of impeachment, another served just five days. Um, with the extremely close vote, allegations of fraud, how likely is it that, that whoever it is, whether it's Castillo or Fujimori taking office, that the next president won't even be able to complete that term? I fear very likely. Again, as in many countries, you should never say no. I don't want to give up hope. There, you know, there there is definitely hope. Castillo is very unknown. He could turn out to have uh, characteristics and abilities that we're not uh, aware of right now. I thought, you know, in the debate and other arenas, he he performed. I mean, given his lack of experience, you know, that he performed well. He could he can be very uh, engaging, you no, know, I believe. So I, I, I think there is a potential here that, that things could go around. But I think the core problem is coming back to what you mentioned a little bit earlier, Gene, which was you know, the first round of the election and the fact that the field was so fragmented, you know, 18 candidates. And there were some eight you know, sort of centrist candidates, more or less palatable, certainly more palatable to most Peruvians than either Keiko Fujimori no, or Pedro Castillo, but they divided that sort of 40% of the vote between them. Uh, and you know, as a result, you know, there are just a lot of people who are saying that first round result was nothing like what we wanted. No, if we had known those would have been the two, of course we would have come around for X or Y, no, Lescano or whoever. Uh, but people didn't because the polls were terrible. It was hard, you know, the, this is a, an election in the middle of a pandemic. People couldn't talk to each other. The pollsters couldn't go out and poll very well in these remote areas. Uh, candidates couldn't get out there. So, so it was a very fraught and difficult, you know, first round that led us to these two candidates who we knew it from the very moment, you know, had these high rates of popular rejection. And then this very, 
uh, confrontational campaign that led people, just as you said, to take these two polarized sides that are now very hostile with each other. When we look at things sort of economically speaking, um, in terms of foreign investment in Peru, um, what is riding on the election in terms of foreign investment um, and, and industries that are ripe for investment and, and in need of it, uh, given who's ultimately elected? Yes. Well, copper prices are very high and the economy has been recovering, you no, know, which, which, is, which is wonderful. Uh, essentially, a lot of Peru's economic growth over the last uh, 20 years has involved uh, mining, and that is controversial in Peru. And so one of the questions with the Castillo government is how would he manage this? I'm sure he knows that, and he's backed away from a lot of, again, the party platforms, much more radical positions of nationalization. And he's spoken much more recently of only uh, you know, renegotiating contracts, which you know, ha has happened in Chile too. So this is very common to want to renegotiate the contracts, especially at a time when you know, prices for these uh, raw materials is uh, improving and China's demand is, is picking up. The, the rub is that Peru does need these investments. They have numerous uh, projects ongoing, uh, but if investors fear you know, turmoil, obviously, they're going to say, hey, let's wait and see what, what happens. Uh, there are other areas. Peru is there. Is, uh, the hope always is for agricultural projects. I mean, Peru has done quite well with non-traditional agricultural exports, including from the mountains. I'm sure Castillo will be very interested in trying to you know, promote that, figure out new products. Some of the uh, agricultural exports, asparagus have taken off on the coast. So uh, I think there are a lot of areas, especially as new irrigation projects go forward, where they could advance. Uh, with that, fishing is always lots of questions, lots of questions of investment there. So there, I think there, and tourism, of course, which is a huge employer. And oh, there's so many beautiful, beautiful places in Peru for tourism development. And uh, I don't, you don't want to restart, you know, on that because you know they're just wonderful, wonderful places that have not been discovered at all by uh, tourists. And especially if there were nice hotels, uh, it could be fantastic for the country. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time today, Cynthia. Really appreciate you uh, helping us to understand the subject about Peru's elections. Well, thank you so much, Jean. I, I really enjoy speaking with you, and uh, we'll just uh, you know, hope very much that uh, things can turn around in, in Peru. Cynthia McClintock, Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the George Washington University, joining us from here in Washington. I'm Jean Coletta, editor of the Latin America Advisor at the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington.